Welcome to this short film, Venus Clots Explained, what a VTE is and how it is diagnosed. This film is part one of a four topic series. It is aimed at ward-based clinical care staff in secondary care. The film will look at what venous thromboembolism or VTE is and how it is diagnosed. My name is Rebecca Locke and I'm an anticoagulation nurse specialist. And I'm Carol Law and I'm a thrombosis education advisor. And together, Rebecca and I have been delivering courses on anticoagulation and clot prevention for over 20 years. We're delighted to be presenting this series of films on behalf of the National Nursing Midwifery Network and Thrombosis UK. And what we're going to do is to start by discussing what clots are. Thrombosis is the formation of a blood clot. And, we, and so we often refer to a blood clot as a thrombosis and they occur inside a blood vessel. Clots can form in the venous system or in the arterial system. When a blood clot forms in veins or the venous system, a patient is said to have a venous thromb thromboembolism or VTE. This can be either a deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and or a pulmonary embolism, PE. So the three abbreviations that you often hear are VTE for venous thromboembolism, DVT for deep vein thrombosis, and PE for pulmonary embolism. When blood clots form in the arteries or the arterial blood system, the patient is said to have had an arterial clot. And these can lead to heart attacks and stroke. In this presentation, we're going to focus on VTE or venous thromboembolism, so clots in the venous system. In the venous system, blood clots most commonly form in the deep veins of the legs or the arms. And as we've just discussed, these are known as deep vein thrombosis or DVT. But they can occur in other veins as well. So, for example, the renal vein. Part of a blood clot can break off and travel in the bloodstream to the pulmonary arteries. And this is known as a pulmonary embolism or PE. And as you can see, we've got a picture of an umbrella here. And this is to signify that collectively DVT and PE are known as VTE or venous thromboembolism. So now Rebecca is going to talk us through a little bit more about what a DVT is. A deep vein thrombosis usually occurs in the deep veins of the leg. However, it can occur in any part of the venous system, for example, the pelvis, abdomen, arm, or even brain. A DVT can develop into a chronic condition known as post-thrombotic syndrome, in which damage to the valves in the veins results in swelling of the limb, pain, and venous hypertension. A deep vein thrombosis requires urgent investigation and treatment. And specifically looking at the symptoms of a DVT, a patient might present with a heavy ache in the affected area, pain, swelling, and tenderness where the DVT has actually occurred, warm skin in the area of the clot or reddening of the skin. And in many cases, there may be few or no symptoms at all, which is very difficult for the patient to then notify the clinical staff. When we're thinking of diagnosis, we need to follow the NICE NG158 pathway. So if patients um, present at hospital, they will first of all need a two level Wells score to estimate the probability of, the, of a DVT. If this shows that a DVT is likely, patient will then have a proximal leg ultrasound um, and if this is shown to be um, positive they would start anticoagulation. If there is delay in an ultrasound um, then a, and the hospital is unable to perform the scan within four hours then anticoagulation should start in preparation. Patients will have a D-dimer test done which will measure um, the levels of D-dimer in the blood, which is an indication that the patient may have found some form of clotting. And the patient will be referred either to the DVT clinic or to the anticoagulation pathway for treatment. 
Pulmonary embolisms occur when a piece of a blood clot breaks loose and travels to the lungs, causing a blockage in one or several parts of the pulmonary circulation. Very large emboli can cause a massive blockage of the pulmonary cir circulation, and the patient obviously will be extremely unwell, and this is a life-threatening condition. If a patient has had a pulmonary embolism, there can be some long-term consequences. So the risk of recurrence and also developing chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or CTEPH, which is when the, patient, the pulmonary circulation, the vessels in the lungs become scarred and are unable to respond appropriately to increases in cardiac output. A pulmonary embolism requires urgent investigation and treatment. If less than 50% of the pulmonary circulation is blocked, then the patient will have shortness of breath, chest pain, or in some cases, no symptoms at all. However, if you have a large pulmonary embolism, the cardinal features would be engorged neck veins, collapse because of hypertension, unexplained hypoxia, and right ventricular gallop. To get a confirmed diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, we need to follow the NICE NG158 pathway. They have a specific pulmonary embolism two-level well score to estimate the probability. And if it is likely that the patient has pulmonary embolism, then you need to do a CTPA which is a CT scan of the pulmonary arterial system, or a VQ scan, which is a ventilation perfusion scan. And this scan looks at two things. It looks at the oxygen going into the lungs and compares it with the um, blood perfusing the lungs. Once you get a positive diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, the patient must be referred to a chest physician for assessment and management. When someone has had a DVT or PE, it's quite clear there are both physical and psychological consequences. And from Rebecca's discussion, we can see that VTE can be both painful and frightening. And for patients who have had a PE, there is that real fear that they might die. So we need to manage both the pain and the physical impact um, of, of, the, of, the, of the PE. So when patients are acutely ill, we're thinking about managing their symptoms and, their, and any psychological impact as well. But we do need to be aware of the long-term consequences of VTE. And as Rebecca's discussed, patients may have a recurrence because once you've had a DVT or a PE, you're much more likely to develop another one. And they can go on to develop the chronic conditions of post-thrombotic syndrome and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Patients who have post-thrombotic syndrome can also develop venous ulcers. And these are very difficult to heal and very expensive. So if we can prevent those from happening, then this is something that we really want to seek to achieve. The work of Rachel Hunter and her colleagues has helped also helped us understand the psychological impact of VTE. And we've had, now have this, this described this condition of post thrombotic panic syndrome and also the concept of thromboneuroses. People with VTE appear particularly vulnerable to anxiety and panic related to physical symptoms. And patients who have experienced missed or late diagnosis are particularly vulnerable. And you can read more about this important work in the learning resources section of this film and, and begin to help us understand what might trigger these panic attacks and, and who needs help in particular. So now we need to consider who is at risk of actually developing a DVT. Well, we understand that people are more likely to, to develop DVTs if when they're over 60, if they're overweight, if they've had a DVT before, if they're taking the combined contraceptive pill or hormone re replacement therapy, HRT, if they have cancer or heart failure, if they've got varicose veins, especially with phlebitis, 
and if they have thrombophilia. But there are also some temporary situations when people are more at risk of a DVT. And these conclude being in or recently having left hospital. And in film three of this series, we're going to focus specifically on hospital acquired thrombosis. But being confined to bed can, at home could also be a potential risk factor. Going on a long journey, and that's said to be of three hours or more, and that could be in a car, in a plane, on a train. So if you're sitting still and not moving, you're more at risk of developing a DVT. Being pregnant and having had a baby in the previous six weeks also predisposes your risk of clotting. And there are specific guidelines relating to the management of clots in pregnant ladies. And being dehydrated is also a situation which could lead you to developing a clot. But sometimes DVT happens for no obvious reasons. And this is referred to as an unprovoked DVT. And we're going to talk about this again when we discuss the treatment of VTE. We, do, we also understand why when patients are admitted to hospital, they are more at risk of developing a clot. The work of Verscher, Verscher in 1856 uh, helped us understand these three broad categories that are involved in the development of clot. So venous stasis, hypercoagulability and endothelial injury. So venous stasis is when the blood is flowing more slowly, hypercoagulability when the blood clots more easily, and endothelial injury occurs when there's damage to the lining of the blood vessel. And as you can see, when somebody comes into hospital, they may be exposed to one, two, or all three of these. And we're going to think about how this impacts on somebody when we look at venous uh, hospital acquired thrombosis in more detail. In August 2021, NICE published new quality standards for both the diagnosis and management of venous thromboembolism and for the prevention of hospital acquired thrombosis. So the standards have, that were previously written for both those um, events have now been combined and we have five quality statements that you can see on the screen in front of you. So quality statement one states that people aged 16 and over who are in hospital and assessed as needing pharmacological VTE prophylaxis started as soon as possible and within 14 hours of hospital admission. So this is one that relates to thromboprophylaxis and hospital acquired thrombosis. Quality statement two states that people aged 16 and over who are discharged with lower limb immobilization are assessed to identify their risk of VTE. So this is also looking at somebody who might require thromboprophylaxis. Quality statement three relates to people aged 18 and over with a deep vein thrombosis, DVT, well score of two points or more, and have proximal leg ultrasound scan within four hours of being requested. So this is a standard that relates to what we've been discussing today and the, treat and the treatment of VTE. Quality statement four states that people aged over 18 and taking anticoagulation treatment after VTE have a review at three months and then at least once a year if they continue to take it long term. And we're going to talk about the discharge of patients with uh, on anticoagulation in the final film of this series. And this statement relates to that group of people. Quality statement five states that people aged 18 and over having outpatient treatment for suspected or confirmed low risk pulmonary embolism have an agreed plan for monitoring and follow up. And again, this relates to the, the discharge of patients following a hospital admission for PE. So we will talk about that in more detail when we think about both anticoagulation treatment and discharge of patients from hospital. Here we have some, ref some, some references that relate to the information that we have been discussing during this short film. And we've also included some learning resources 
that you might want to go away and have a look at because they will explain in more detail some of the issues that we have discussed. We've also included some quality improvement points. So these are activities that you might wish to undertake in order to understand what, what the care and management of DVT and PE uh, is like in your clinical area. So you want, might want to revisit the signs and symptoms of DVT so that you understand what to look out for when you're at work. What opportunity, and think about the opportunities you have to do this during your routine care, to revisit the signs and symptoms of PE, and to think about the protocols in your clinical area and what you need to do if you su suspect that a patient has had a PE, and then think about if the practice that you're seeing is aligned with this. And then to think more about the potential physical and psychological consequences of VTE and to have a, have a look and see what measures are taken in your clinical area to reduce their impact. And I think this is particularly relevant to the psychological consequences because this is something that is, is much more, is newer, a newer introduction into practice.